Welcome to Winning the Game of Life. Known as Jungle Man at the poker table, Dan Cates has gone from being the bag boy at McDonald's with no friends and a dead-end future to winning over $11 million in online poker, over $7 million in live tournaments, and is a World Series of Poker champion. He has found fame, fortune, been to incredible places all over the globe, and connected with some amazing people. It looks like Dan has won the game of life, but that is not the way he sees it. Dan sees winning as doing his part to help everyone in the world win. He knows he can't do it alone, though. He knows it's going to take a collective effort with anyone that wants to see the same thing. Join us each week as Dan starts the conversation to do just that. On the show, Dan will interview incredible individuals that have made the impossible possible, those that have won the game of life, and those that want to help others win as well. Hit subscribe and follow Dan's journey on Instagram at the Dan Cates. Let's explore anyone and anything that can help make this world a better place, increasing the odds of us all winning the game of life. And now, here's your host, Dan Cates. What's up, everyone? This is Daniel Cates, aka Jungle Man, and today I've got, uh, I believe, the highest stakes cash game player uh, woman that are, that there is. She's played on high stakes poker, poker after dark two, I think, um, and other TV shows. She's played in um, the many World Series of Poker tournaments. Um, she's the First woman to ever win two World Series of Poker bracelets and is, yeah, one of my competition. Um, she's been my competition, actually. She's uh, played against, I played against her a number of times in uh, Bobby's room. Jennifer Harmon, what's up? Hey, Jungle. Uh, nothing much, just hanging out at home. Did you Waiting win any more? The- what's that? Waiting for the World Series. And me too. Did you win any more bracelets since, um, yeah, have you won more bracelets than uh, the first two? I haven't. I've had a few seconds and a few thirds, but never, uh, never a third. I was at, I played in the mixed game tournament at the World Series of Poker London, the first one they ever had. Mm -hmm. And I came second, which I should have won. it. I made a mistake. Oh, no. That's the most annoying. It's it's most annoying when you make a mistake, and it's I mean for me it's most annoying when I personally make a mistake versus bad luck. Although I personally think it's a little bit of an illusion uh, sometimes, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it wasn't. Uh, my competitor, my opponent, the only game he was really familiar with was Texas Hold'em, Limit Hold'em, because it was a horse event. Mm-hmm. And I could have just stayed out of those pots because it was, you know, it was actually, it played the biggest. So I got involved in more pots than I should have and should have just waited till the rest of the games. Uh, you got to, uh, what's the word? Too Impatient. I was Agreed. thinking, yeah, something like impatient. Yeah, that is, I've, I feel like I haven't been in those situations too much where the opponent is like that much worse at other games and you just don't want to like give them a chance in their own game. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he's gotten better at them since, but at that time it was a little different. It'd be funny if he was listening to this and <laughs> sitting here <laughs> and felt like, or if he listens to this and feels like a little uh, upset, I always think it's funny. Um, I, if I recall correctly, you wrote the section of Limit Holden in uh, Doyle, Brun- Doyle Brunson's book. I think the second su- Super System book. Is that right? Yes, that is right. I remember playing, um, well, it was at Binion's Horseshoe, and they had the cash games at Binion's, and the tournaments were upstairs in the bingo room. Mm-hmm. I remember coming down there playing four and 8,000 and I came down and I took a seat and Doyle said, I want you to write the limit hold'em chapter in my book. Cause I see you do things that nobody understands. So I was very honored and, you know, it 
took me forever to write it because I write like I'm two, but it was fun. It was a good experience and it's a part of history that I'm happy to be part of. Well, congratulations on being part of history or adding okay. that to your legacy. Uh, what were these things that you did that no one understood? Um, I could get uh, the best hand to fold and be up against the worst hand. Oh, Things okay. Like okay. I mean, the them has changed a lot since back then. So it's definitely played differently. Sure. Kind of curious. Uh, be nice to have a time machine and see what, what did change. Although I remember how I know how No Limits changed a bit. Um, definitely solvers really changed things a lot. For sure. Uh, with, you know, definitely with No Limit with most games. I don't think people are using solvers yet as much or at all for mixed games, but I'm sure it's coming. I might be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, I think it depends. Personally. I mean, I've always been a field type of person. Um, so maybe that's why I'm not very good at no limit hold them. Because <laughs> it's just so, um, it's played so well because of the solvers. It, it, it's, there's still room to, to use your feeling. It's more in the sense of what, if someone will fold, if someone will, what kind of size someone will call, like things like that you can use your feeling for. Um, you, get, you can get a feeling for how people tend to play spots and that sort of thing. Like I don't actually use, I, it's good, useful to know the, what the GTO solution is or the computer solution. Um, it's useful to know so that you can see where people lay on the line and then exploit them appropriately. Uh, but for the latter part, you need some kind of feeling you could say or intuition. Yeah, I definitely makes sense. I'm always in no limit hold them, try and figure out what people are capable of mm -hmm. yeah. and play accordingly. Sure. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's pretty much what I, what I think as well. You were uh, a natural poker player. What do you think it is about you that makes you such a naturally gifted poker player? Uh, wow. I have no idea. I, I would say that early on in my career uh, that I felt like I just copied everybody's play. I just watch and copy and I had zero talent. But then I remember talking to Daniel about a hand that I played in Limit Hold'em and where I was able to like check raise because I knew this guy was going to bet. And I, you know, I just knew what was going to happen on the flop and was able to manipulate the flop. And Daniel said, you don't copy anybody, Jennifer, you have talent. And that was the first time I kind of realized that I actually did have a little bit of talent. But before that, I just felt like I was copying everybody's play and felt like I had no talent. So, hmm. you know, I don't know how, you know, organically I became a good poker player. It just, it just, I always felt at home in a poker room, in the poker settings, at the poker table. I always felt like um, that it was just normal for me to be there and natural. And, uh, you know, I just loved playing poker. And okay. I think love for the game you know, made me get better and want to try harder. All right. It sounds, my guess is that um, I can tell you a little bit about my, about my experience. Uh, I would imagine that loving the game definitely helps. And personally, I wouldn't even advise someone to make it a career unless they really did love it for whatever reason. Um, but uh, just because it just seems like a tough way to make a living unless you really do love it. And it just sounds like you were very, would you say that you were very observant of other people? Yeah, I was very observant. I felt like I had to be, uh, you know, I felt, I always felt like I was new to the game. Hmm. And, uh, 
And still, I, you know, sometimes I play against players where I still feel like I'm in kindergarten. You know, I, I'm always learning. I'm always trying to be objective. I'm always trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong and the things that I'm doing good. And, you know, when I go home after I play a session, I run the hands through my head, you know, the ones that I win and the ones that I lose and, you know, try to you know, give myself a grading as far as how I played, because that's the most important thing to me is how I played. You know, wins and losses are go with the game, but yeah, it's how you play. But, you know, I've had my fair share of law. I've had my fair share of up and ups and downs. And you, know, you have to have, you have to have heart and a strong stomach to be able to get through it. Yeah. You have to find a way to deal with the, deal with it or deal with the, um, or like make it not hurt so much. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I've done a lot of self talks over the years. Uh, you know, but sometimes I have to take weeks off or maybe a month off to get my head straight to be able to go down there and play again at what I think is my best, which isn't easy all the time. It seems like something uh, other people can learn from. I can say that I personally was not very observant mid-hand or generally speaking when I was watching people play. It was like really hard for me to discern uh, the noise, but uh, it does seem like a better way to, it seems better in some ways to learn by watching. It helped me a lot personally to, mm, uh, to focus on it like off the table, I guess you could say. Or if I saw someone doing something, uh, particularly against me, I would like take it from them is what I would personally do. I wouldn't like watch. Yeah, I wouldn't watch so much in between. Um, but that's just just how I learn. I'm not very, not very in tune with the environment when uh, I'm playing in the same sense that other people are. Um, at least when I'm not in a hand. People do get distracted, but you know, even if you're not, even if you don't think you're watching, you kind of am. You know what I mean? It's kind of. Well, yeah. I mean, you have to pay attention to who's losing and who's winning and uh, like what people are doing in terms of bluffing. And if someone's on tilt for whatever reason, uh, the big pots matter a bit more. If someone's quite frustrated because they've lost a million hands in a row. Uh, that's important. It's more of those live poker things. And I have to say, I'm a very emotional person. So it does come out in poker, too. And I've had to kind of learn how to play with my emotions. So to kind of, you know, make people believe that I'm playing badly because I'm emotional, but I am emotional, but I don't think my chips get emotional, hmm. but I'm sure sometimes they do. But I try to, you know, play the best I can every time I'm playing poker. If you're emotional, and you play. successful, but if you're emotional, and and you, huh? I said it's not always successful, but live and learn. Well, yeah, of course. Um, don't recall seeing you tilt, but I'm not sure. You never know. Emotional. I get emotional. I, you know, sometimes I swear people. <laughs> well, but, that's normal. Certain people need to be sweared at. Well, no, scare, 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 scare. Oh, scare. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can be emotional. I can be very emotional. The trick is to like use those emotions against everybody else. All right. Which I, I have a lot of experience of. I suppose, uh, I suppose people could take that away and use that. Um, of course. Okay. That's. A certain kind of strategy. Uh, I've got a question. Your mother passed away when you were a teen, uh, which sounds traumatic. And you escaped. Uh, it sounds like you used poker as an escape. How, how did that work? 
Well, granted, I was very young when my mom passed away, so I wasn't 21 yet, but I got I played poker in the casinos. I played this 10 handed limit hold'em game, three and six dollar. And it kind of, you know, just being around people and people I didn't know and and being able to focus on something else, it just it, you know, it took away some of that you know, anxiety or the tragedies. And it was, yeah, it was pretty brutal because my mom died. And then a year later, they told me I had six months to live because my kidneys were failing too. Uh, it was brutal. So, um, or six months until my kidneys failed. And then when they actually did, they gave me two months to live if I didn't get a kidney transplant. Hmm. So, you know, it all kind of flowed together. Um, but I remember being in kidney failure and playing three and six dollar limit hold'em as a way to like pass the time and pass the days, waiting to get better and healthy again. Never heard of it as therapy, but uh, sounds great that it was, especially with the swings. I would think it would be it would add to the stress. Well, I was playing three and six dollar. So the swings weren't extremely high. I think my bankroll was like 3,500. You know, I really didn't think about the money, which is probably a good thing. So I didn't have to support myself. I was just a kid. Did you have to pay? Did you use poker to pay for the the kidney, kidney transplants? No, my insurance covered it. Oh, okay, okay. I did use poker to pay my pay through college, but by that time I was healthy and good to go. I'm glad it all worked out for you. Um, sounds like you got through it pretty well. Uh, yeah, I've never heard of poker being used as therapy. I have to think like for me, it was never really, never really therapy. I'm not sure. Well, actually, I guess it was at some point when. Didn't have much going on in my life. It was exciting to rate to get to ascend in the stakes. Did you um, climb? What ages did you climb in the stakes? Was that in college or was that outside of college? Uh, no, it was after college. Oh, okay, okay. So I, you did... I grew up in Reno and I moved to LA. And I ran into a random person who I played poker with in Reno. And he told me about these games that are going on at the Commerce and the Bicycle Club and that I should go down and play. And that's basically what I did. And I started off playing, I think, three and six dollar. And I worked my way up to 30 and 60 pretty quickly. And then there was this the big game was like three and six hundred. And I just kept looking at that game. I want to play in that game. And. I just, you know, climbed my way up and, you know, it never got much bigger than that. I guess when I was climbing my way up, maybe four and 800, six and 1200. And I just kind of grew with the game then. And then we would play it all the way up to four and 8,000. But I just kind of grew with the game. I didn't say, oh, a little bit I'm of a jump. Four and <laughs> oh, and then four and 8,000 came along. <laughs> <laughs> a little different. <laughs> Uh, how are the players at 300, 600, and 400, 800 compared to the lower stakes? They were much better. Really? But, you know, oh, okay. Spoil and chip and, you know, all the regulars who have been playing poker for combined century experience. Weren't you also part of the corporation against uh, Andy Beal? Uh, was that the four and 8,000 or... I don't, I don't know what stakes it was against Andy Beal, but maybe the mother, maybe it was bigger. No, it was, it was bigger. I mean, when he first came to town, we played one in 2000 for a couple hours. And then we played the next game and this was a ring game. We played two and 4,000 and the next day it was four and 8,000. And then he got bored and he wanted to play heads up. So that's when the corporation was formed. So we started out playing 10 and 20,000. The normal, the normal game usually was 50 and 100,000. And one time we played one in 200,000. 
All right. And uh, for the people that don't know, uh, Andy Beal, uh, as we were pointing out, uh, seemed to play enormously big so that um, Jennifer Harmon and other players combined bankrolls to try to win this guy's money. Playing heads up. We never played together with the combined bankrolls. But yeah, playing heads up. But, you know, Andy, he didn't, you know, he, he was very curious about the game. I was, I was playing against him, the one in 200,000 game. And I'm pretty sure he called 200,000 on the end with eight high because he wanted to see what I had. <laughs> I'm sure if he would have just said, Jennifer, what do you have? What do you have? I probably would have showed him. <laughs> that occurs. Oh. You know, he's true to the game. He's got to, like, call so he can show that he's he's a real gambler. I mean, it, <laughs> eight high can win sometimes in Loon Oldham. I might have, may have done that myself a couple times. No, I won it with six high one time against Aaron Katz. You know, the play would have been to raise him on the end because I only had six high. But, but I just you... felt he had a certain hand, and I could beat it with the six high. Did you beat it? I did. <laughs> that's even better what are you talking about the play is to call and put, whatever it is the play i guess the play is really to just to win the hand but calling's even better because it would put him on complete rage tilt and probably did he probably tilted like mad like a madman after <laughs> did he not i don't remember but i do know that i won that session i think we're just playing 500 and a thousand heads up <laughs> huh. limit and i remember i did win that session and, and he'll confirm it that I called with the six high. Will, will he confirm it? I'm not. I feel like maybe he, I feel like I want to bet on that. Um, <laughs> just because, I mean, there's, I feel like there's a chance. He just seems like the kind of person who might not. But I don't, I don't know 100%. Um, don't bet on it. It would be easy money for me if I was like in the room when he was answering the question. All right. Uh, does it, uh, how does it feel to be a woman playing in a male dominated sport? Well, I don't know. I feel weird calling poker a sport, to be honest. Uh, a male dominated arena. Uh, any, any challenges associated with it? No, I've always felt like, like I'm home. I always felt like, you know, I've had my fair share of abuse through the years, but it never bothered me. I remember one time playing in a 50 hundred uh, limit hold'em game at the bicycle club and this guy showed up and I guess he was going through a really nasty divorce, but he hated all women. So I was the target for him. He probably called me the C word a hundred times in the game, but he also lost $25,000 in the game in a 50 and a hundred game. So it's like, call me what you want. You know, if you need to get the stress off, just call me what you want. You know, you just use every name. I don't really care because he was just throwing away his money. Yeah, I personally don't mind being called a bunch of bad words if uh, someone's going to lose a lot of money. I do think some people really take offense to that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I feel like 25000 probably is uh, is worth it for that. Those limits. <laughs> yeah. Let's take so, but, hmm? uh, but, you know, any abuse that's ever gone my way, it's just rolls off my shoulder because when somebody is, you know, upset or whatever, that means they're off their game. And I can take advantage of that as anybody can. You know what I mean? So it does never really bother me. The purpose of me playing poker is to make money. So. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a healthy way to look at it. Um, I recall that you, uh, I feel, I think you mentioned to me that poker helped you with being a mom. Can you explain that? Sure. I mean, being a poker player, you really have to be objective about your play. I mean, you have to have some sort of ego too, um, and, and, and confidence to be able to play, you know, well, but you also have to be objective. You, you know, you really have to, uh, you know, when you play bad or you think, you know, or you think you play bad, you really have to come to terms with that. So I think it's helped me with my boys because 
I feel like I'm more objective with them. I listen to them. I, I don't, I'm not going to like just, you know, whatever, put, put, you know, slam the gavel down and say, no, it's my way or the highway. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to listen to, you know, what their concerns are and, you know, how they feel about things and be objective about it and make decisions that way. And I think, you know, being a poker player, always having to be objective about my play through the years that I'm able to understand, okay, I'm being too, too overbearing or I'm being, you know, this, this isn't right. And, you know, and I feel like sometimes I am wrong and it allows me to apologize to them because I was wrong and just be objective about being a mom. Hmm. I hope that uh, that poker helps in exactly the kinds of ways that you're saying. Are you saying that it helps you become like a better listener? And uh, it sounds like you're saying it, it helps you to become more objective about viewing the situation also helps you to become a better listener for uh, other people. Yeah, it definitely helps me be more objective about viewing the situation. Definitely, you know, listening so I can make good decisions on, you know, parenting. I mean, being a parent is not easy. It's very difficult. And you're always like second guessing yourself and self doubting yourself. It sounds like being in a relationship with someone who's, uh, it's, it reminds me of being in a relationship from, it reminds me of dating someone who would always point the finger at you uh, and it was very difficult to date. I don't know. It's just because you'd have to like, I, I don't know if this is a good analogy. I've never had kids, so it's hard for me to relate, but um, I would always try to like put my mind, put myself in their shoes and that kind of thing and like decide if I'm being fair or if they're like, if they're out of line or that kind of thing, is this, does this sound, does this ring any bells or am I just way off? No, you're, you're right on. I mean, that's what I try to do. I like try to put myself in their shoes and what they're feeling and what they're seeing. And, and, you know, basically you're right on because that's what I try to do with them. I try to figure out what they're, how they're seeing things instead the, of. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Instead of like, you know, me just knowing what's right mm -hmm. because, you know, everybody gets it wrong oh, and sure. things in a different way than I see things. I mean, they're kids. They don't, it's a lot of things they don't understand. So, you know, I explain a lot. I talk to them a lot. Communication. I, I, I don't think I've ever punished my kids. They've never been grounded. I don't hit, I don't smack them around. I don't think I've ever punished them. Um, I just talk since they were little, you know, we, the communication's always been open, you know, if that's the way to, uh, I do. I don't know one thing about raising kids. Uh, I wonder if that's the way to do it. I, uh, am a bit curious. Um, one thing is that definitely poker teaches you to put yourself in the other person's shoes and think about how to counter what they're doing i presume there's like an equivalent of this in um dealing with people especially people who are not exactly on the same wavelength wavelength as you um and you have to like think about okay how does how, how does dealing with them actually solve the problem whereas uh i would presume that grounding gets into the picture depending on what the problem is uh but i don't know uh, I know that certain things are off limits or should be. I know that communication is generally a good thing, but I, I just don't know because kids are uh, difficult, not exactly typically reasonable people. True. They, they, you know, they learn throughout the years. I mean, kids, you know, when they're little, they only think about themselves as, as they should because, you know, that's it, their brain hasn't developed, you know, really to like think about what other people want that, you know, so, so yeah, it's just, you know, I don't know, you know, my son and when they were in middle school, because now they just, they're tomorrow's their last day of ninth grade. So they're going to be sophomores next year, but in middle school, my son said to me, 
He said, you're lucky. All my friends hate their parents, but I love you more than anything in the world. And I tell you everything. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good thing. That's good affirmation. That's good affirmation. <laughs> that is, it does seem that, that does strongly suggest you're doing something right. Uh, I wonder how much luck plays a role into this. And just some kids just always hate their parents. <laughs> um, I yeah, find I just, that. But, I huh? just feel like if you're not judgmental and you listen and you're objective, then you're going to get a kid that's going to respect you. And, and I try to like, like let them figure it out. I'm going to keep that in mind for when I eventually have kids. Uh, I will say, by the way, dealing with some adults, I uh, have tried the respect route and it feels like some adults uh, are impossible to get through. And if I could, I would absolutely ground them. So I, I'm I'm a little pressed. I think that you've gotten this far with your kids and not grounded them. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, I don't know. I wonder if if for whatever reason, I guess adults can decide to just be cunts. Uh, well, also, yeah. too, you know, I feel that adults feel like their way is the best way, or it's the highway, and they put that on their kids and. They expect their kids to live up to these expectations and sometimes it's impossible. Oh, for sure. I mean, for sure, a, the so. adults must make the mistake a lot. I tend to agree. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, and I believe as a parent, you have to go easier on yourself, just like poker. You know, you might play bad. You have losing sessions. You have to go easy on yourself. You have to forgive yourself. You have to um, give yourself another chance. Imagine parenting has some brutal downswings. I mean, a lot of responsibility. I probably do, I don't know, anywhere from three to five loads of laundry today. It's like a hotel in my, in my house. They like use one towel and it's gone. It's in the, it's in the laundry room or they get changed twice a day and, you know, just their clothes aren't even dirty, but they're in the laundry basket. So there's a lot of responsibility with raising kids but the thing with poker is that you know before poker I was pretty you know I was fearless I didn't care about going broke I didn't care about you know a lot of stuff but once you have kids you have to care about that because you can't say okay let's go we're moving to the car you know you just can't do that kind of stuff so I you know I don't want to play as high as I used to you know, you know, I, you know, I just make different decisions. Hmm. No, that definitely makes sense. I've heard that echoed through a lot of people who finally have kids. So those were not the kinds of downswings that I was envisioning. I was thinking more emotional downswings because you're fighting with them or you, they're guilt tripping you or, uh, um, I, I, does the word gaslight apply here? I'm not sure because I just feel like kids would have these ridiculous perspectives and like, if you're constantly trying to do the right thing, you can easily have your mind warped by them or decide, you know, maybe you've done something wrong kind of thing, which I don't know if it's exactly, if you have too much of that trade, it would end up not really being a good thing. Am I on the right track here? I've read some books about raising kids, ironically, <laughs> accidentally, or at least there's chapters in them. I don't know if, you know, basically what I just try, tried to do and tried to do and still do is listen to them, answer all their questions honestly, no matter what questions they are. And some are pretty painful to um, answer and try and steer them in the right way. Like, you know, one of my sons, maybe he was eight years old and he came up to me and asked me what meth was. I'm like, well, <laughs> see how I can answer this one. So basically, you know, I told him what it was. I told him it's a very bad drug. And then I pulled up pictures online of meth addicts with no teeth. I tried to work pictures. I, happens to people take meth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, she was, she's 25 and now she looks like she's 65. Yeah, probably. Go ahead. So that's basically, you know, what I've tried to do as a parent is 
uh, you know, uh, just communicate and try and steer them in the right directions. Like one of my sons, I have twin boys. One of them is ADHD. And from an early age, uh, you know, I figured it out. We got him tested. I think it was in second grade. So I don't demand a lot from him in school because I know his brain is going a million miles an hour and it's really hard to stay focused. And I know by the end of the year, he's just done. So I don't focus on grades. He's brilliant. He's a very smart kid. I'm not worried about him at all as far as success in life. But, you know, a lot of times I could punish him for things that he's done, but he doesn't mean to do them. So that would be mean. It would be like horrible if I punished him for things that he can't even help doing. So I was happy that at a young age, I was able to figure things out with him and treat it accordingly, because usually the ADHD kid can act however he wants, because that's, you know, his condition. It's up to the parents to be able to not react to that. So, you know, that's, you know, that kind of stuff. And like, you know, he does very little around the house. And I say, like, I think this was like two months ago. I said, you know, I'm really swamped here. <coughs> oh, bless you. Well, thanks. You Go know, ahead. I'm really swamped here. I need some help. If you could help me out, I would love it. And he goes, of course, mommy, just ask me whatever you want. I'll do anything. And then I asked him to take out the garbage and, 10 minutes later, he runs upstairs and he didn't take out the garbage. And I walked up and I said, Hey, I asked you to take <laughs> out the garbage. And he said, Oh yeah, I forgot. You know, I get a lot of that, which is fine because it's normal for him to just forget. So then, you know, we take out the garbage together. All right. I have a bit of a, I want to play a little devil, devil's advocate because I can totally see people using it as excuse, you know, like some people to say, Oh, I forgot. Um, it, you know, like for example, like if I did something really stupid socially, I could say, oh, I just do really stupid things every once in a while. Um, but if I knew what I was doing, for example, I could use it as an excuse. I just want to ask, does he ever do that? Um, does he ever like, because some people do that for sure. Manipulate me? Huh? You mean manipulate me? Yeah, manipulate having the condition. Right. Um, I don't want to put it. Well, I mean, this just throwing this out there. I don't know if it's actually true or not. Probably there's probably a little bit of that going on, and that's okay with me. I mean, my other son, his twin brother, who's not ADHD, if I ask him to take out the trash, he does it immediately. It's like a no-brainer. Oh. Just, I guess that's a good <laughs> sign, even though they're not the same people. Yeah, they're very different but they get along extremely well. They both have each other's backs all the time. Can you give another example of, or a specific example of how poker would help with uh, being a mother? Being a what? Being a mother? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it helps you to be more responsible. Sure, sure. But can you uh, explain, can you show a, a situation and show how like the thought process would be somewhat similar as it would be in poker? Okay, let me think about Maybe that. a little bit of a challenge. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I know, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities that come with being a mother which are kind of like the same responsibilities you have to be with poker. I don't know if I'm answering your question right. Well, you could go into those responsibilities and I could help draw the parallel. Well, I'm just, you know, like, like time, let's say, uh, let me see, like if you're playing, I mean, when I played poker before being a mother, time was no object to me. It's like I played poker when I wanted. I, you know, nothing really, it, you know, nothing really mattered. Mm -hmm. You know, if I wanted to go play poker. I want to play poker. Um, being a mother, I mean, there are certain restrictions, certain things that you have to think about with them. 
which, you know, with, you, it makes you more structured as a poker player. So you don't play for 48 hours because you're buried and make those bad decisions. You know, you, you learn very quickly that you have this much time and to play the best you can during that time because you only have, um, you know, whatever it is, six hours, seven hours. And it's another thing. It's like, if you're losing and you don't feel like you're playing your best, sometimes you don't get up, you know, and you end up losing more. But I feel that when I'm losing, I, I would much rather be home spending time with my kids than sitting there beating my brains out at a poker table, losing and probably not playing all that well. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. It's, it's a version of time management, perhaps, or awareness of your mental state and how to use time appropriately around that. Right. And you kind of always have to be on call as a poker player and as a parent. Like I could be playing poker and my kids will call me and they'll be very upset about something and I have to go. Hmm. Um, it's just the way, you know, the way it is sometimes. You just have to leave. All right. Um, I can see some parallel. Uh, so empathy and responsibility and like certain kinds of awareness sounds like. I mean, I think awareness is the biggest because I think that's one of the most important attributes of being a really good poker player is awareness. Awareness in one sense? In what sense? Awareness of yourself? Internal awareness? Awareness, awareness of how you're playing yourself. Awareness of how other people are playing and um, how you can take advantage of that. I mean, I think awareness is a huge part of poker. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, yeah, I would say so. I think personally, internal awareness, thinking about it is most important. Um, yeah, which comes down also to applying responsibility, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I think one hidden um, thing we touched on was perception uh, and not coming to judgment very quickly. I personally think this is I, this is useful in anything, um, but poker absolutely teaches that. And usually, when people are too fixed in their judgments, they it leads to a lot of bad play and leads to people them opening up to being exploited and all that. And uh, as you were talking about with listening to your kids' perspectives, that's an example of perception. Perception is simply. Is, is basically listening. Um, it's, it, well, listening is a form of perception, but perception is not making a, a sound, a specific judgment and just looking for more information. The, mm, there's some situations where, there's a lot of situations where decisive action is better, but uh, even so, being perceptive is really important. A hundred percent, I agree. I mean, I hate, I don't like to prejudge at a poker table. I like to just wait and see and watch uh, because, you know, a lot of people have surprised me over the years. Oh yeah. There's some real, uh, there are some fruit loops. I uh, would be very interested in seeing how often, uh, generally speaking, judgments are accurate, both for amateur players and for professionals. I, I think they're going to be less accurate for professionals um, if there's some way to test that. I tend to agree with you, for sure. Uh, I just think that the professionals have kind of ironed out their arbitrary tendencies, which are usually at the odds of playing well, um, are usually not helpful for playing well. It's not helpful for playing well to have idiosyncrasies, let's put it this way. Um, I, uh, I, I just want to comment that I personally kind of, I never, I have like really loose judgments, which uh, I find to be very useful for poker, but this is just naturally who I am. 
this one was was just naturally who I am. I think a lot of people judge very quickly and kind of stick to those judgments, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I don't. Personally, I don't do that. Okay. I'm very non-judgmental in poker, in life, and everything. Okay. So that's not me. All right, cool. I actually think this is a really important trait to talk about. In fact, it's written in a book. It's at least written in a couple books. I think this one... There's this distinction being made of this Donald Trump personality at the opposite end of the of the spectrum versus a uh, foxy personality. It was either in um, Nate Silver's book or in Daniel Common's book, Conman's book. But basically, um, a uh, foxy personality is the kind that we're talking about. One that doesn't come to sound judgments. Doesn't, it doesn't feel absolutely sure about what they think all the time. Whereas the Donald Trump personality is the, uh, the guy who always says what, it, whoever thinks, whatever they think is how it is. And that kind of thing. Um, I don't know how much, how changeable these things are, but personally, I don't think that people with these Donald Trump kinds of personalities can well, I don't know. I don't know if they can change that much or not. I'm curious to see. But basically, uh, yeah, this comes down to, again, to the uh, what we're talking about as being perceptible, excuse me, being having the perceiving quality is much more useful in poker than just jumping to conclusions and having lots of bravado with them. Well, yeah, I mean, when you play a hand of poker with somebody and you're just jumping to conclusions, I think that's a recipe for disaster. I, you know, you have to think about the whole story of the hand and before you make all your decisions, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Well, on the river, I'm saying, but like during the hand, I mean, I, it's very important to stay perceptive instead of, you know, judgy mm -hmm. it's uh, like it's like you know a lot of people put it in their mind okay they did this to me so they're doing it again to me and again and again and again mm -hmm. and then they, i fall into that <laughs> they lose their perception you know what i mean about yeah. the person about you know maybe they do have a good hand maybe you know Maybe they do play bad hands, but once in a while they do play good hands. You know what I mean? You just, it's, you have to, there's, you know, a bigger picture. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, those situations, there's definitely people get hit by the deck every, every now and then. I've uh, been surprised quite a lot uh, by people in poker and dealing with people on the whole. I think really the quality of, uh, not judging is really important because oftentimes uh, I I've, I've found them dealing with people. It's really easy to make errors in judgment that are just not at all accurate. And I find that people like do this all the time. I personally find it very frustrating because people just seem to assume that everyone's an idiot uh, and. I mean, the, the reason I bring this up is because when you're raising kids, it's really easy for parents to feel that way. And uh, it, it just doesn't really get a lot of things done in an effective way, if that makes sense. And you uh, very often the truth is not what people think it is. Is what? The very truth is what? The truth is not what people think it is uh, when it comes to dealing with other people and what what their actual reasons for doing certain things are what's actually going through their head specifically if that makes sense yeah no, it makes perfect sense i mean i just think um go ahead no i just feel that you know life and poker are quite a bit alike i mean you know it seems like you know, I give a lot of people the benefit of the, of the doubt in life, and I carry that onto the poker table, too, that I, you know, I give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't just automatically label them as an idiot. Yeah. 
Well, also, also, it's a good, I, I think it's a good strategy to do that for a couple of reasons, because uh, if you don't give someone the benefit of the doubt uh, and you immediately assume they're an idiot, it's going to like, this leads to a lot of problems. Whereas if you do give someone the benefit of the doubt uh, and it's there, the problem is a lot easier to fix. And if you if you go the other way, it's a lot harder to backtrack and fix it, if you know what I mean. I do. I, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah, and you could still you could still uh find out the other person is in fact an idiot after giving them the benefit of the doubt. Of course. <laughs> so that too. Of course. But you know, nothing's locked in stone when you're playing in the poker room and parenting. Nothing is locked in stone. Everything changes. There are situations that are different. You know, it's just, you just kind of have to roll with everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, be objective, be perceptive, keep an open mind, and don't be too judgy. All right. I agree totally. Don't be too judgy. I hope the audience uh, agrees with us as well. Um, you uh, experienced a few health issues. Um, uh, not, I, uh, did, excuse me. Um, let me back up a little bit. What other health issues did you experience besides the kidneys, um, the kidney issues and, uh, how has that shaped you? Well, basically it's all kidney issues. Nothing really else oh. is like health related, you know, I had my first transplant when I was a kid and then I had another transplant in 2004. So when your kidneys start to fail, you know, you're, you're definitely, you're, you're not healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time my kidneys started to fail, my blood pressure went crazy because something about your body trying to regulate to try and fix your kidney, which causes your kidney to, I don't know, to um, produce this hormone or whatever it is that makes your blood pressure go out of control. I was probably at stroke levels many times before my transplant. And we're talking like a blood pressure of 240 over 140 for weeks. Oh, really? Like, that sounds like, quite serious. Like, you know, emergency room blood pressure. Let's hope they can get it down. And, you know, things like that that went on. But once I got my second kidney, you know, everything went back to normal. Everything was fine. But when I was a kid and I was on dialysis, they told me I had two months to live because my body just didn't respond well to dialysis. So I was lucky enough to get a kidney within that two months. And then after I was perfectly healthy, physically, mentally, it's a little different. Mentally, you know, you don't feel like you're going to die as a kid, but it's still in the back of your mind. So you live life a little differently. And maybe that's why I don't say no to my kids ever. <laughs> because life is too short. And, you know, you really want to do everything you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because I've been at death's door twice. And... I don't feel, I don't like to live in the past. I live more in the present, but I also like, you know, I live in the future, but you know, I don't, I don't like to, um, like if I get angry or upset, I don't like to stay that way because it's unproductive. It's not fun. It's whatever I want to move on. And it just, I just want to live life. And when my kids ask me to do something, it's like, Okay, I could say no, because it could be dangerous. It's not that dangerous. I want them to experience it. This is life. Then it's, you know, it's always a yes. Because right. I've had the experience of almost dying. So I know how important life is and I live life that way. All right. So no time for resentment and regret. Exactly. You know, once that, that, that door is open to death, you look at life a lot differently. You know, COVID has been a challenge. 
because I do take, I take medicine that suppresses my immune system. So that means um, uh, for people who have transplants, it's a little more trickier. And when COVID first came around, transplant patients who got COVID were dying at 30%. That's pretty high. Well, that is crazy. Yeah, you know, that's a way you, crazier number. I've never, never heard about that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, crazy. And then after vaccines, 47% of transplant patients weren't even getting antibodies because the medicine suppresses your T cells and B cells. So they weren't even building antibodies to the vaccine. So they're basically unprotected. So they figure out different ways to get antibodies inside of you. And they've come up with a few things, but it's been a, you know, quite a challenge because, you know, you, you can't do, you can't live life like you want to live life. You kind of have to isolate yourself. And, you know, I skipped World Series. I haven't played poker for two and a half years inside a casino. Hmm. So, I mean, life is a little different now. And I think mentally kind of fucks with your brain. You know, are you ever going to be back to normal mentally? But I guess you just have to dive in. COVID's going to be around for a long time. All I can do is protect myself as much as I can. I did build antibodies towards the vaccines. And I do have like these, these new things that they're doing uh, for transplant patients. So, and all I can do is hope and pray that I'll be fine if I get COVID. I think but, it's gone 30% to 2%. Oh, well, that's... That sounds promising. I had no idea it was like that serious, not uh, that much of a hurdle. I don't um, think most people understand and don't get it. I think uh, you know, it's hard to get it when you haven't been in the situation. A lot of people aren't empathetic to things that they haven't, that yeah. they don't understand or they haven't dealt with. Oh, that's 100% true. Like, I also haven't seen that part of COVID myself. So it's a bit eye opening. For me to hear, you know, about um, about your situation, uh, you know, I mostly deal with young people and people at the poker tables and I'm traveling and all this stuff. And I don't really see COVID, actually. Uh, but, yeah, uh, like even as I said, talking to you opens my eyes myself. Yeah, you know, my kids have been great. They've been amazing. They know exactly, you know you know, how dangerous it could be to me. And they just act accordingly. I mean, they're always careful, even though now they do go to, they go to school. They have, you know, their high school's 3000 kids, but they both have had COVID and they stayed with their dad while they had COVID. So basically, you know, they're protected for a little while anyway. So, uh, well, but it's just another part of life, you know, like who knows what happened in those two years, I don't know. I just, I just, I don't regret and I don't look back and I don't, it's just not me. All right. So, no regret. I don't, record, I don't you know, it, it, it really, it hasn't really, I don't play victim, that kind of stuff. It's kind of like, you know, this two and a half years have been kind of, it's been cool. It's been fine. I've been playing a lot of golf, having fun, you know, that kind of stuff you know, eat outside. It's kind of nice to eat outside. So it sounds so bad when you put it that way, COVID and chill. Exactly. That, that was not the, the originator of COVID and chill. This is what I did with my uh, COVID friends. When we caught it, <laughs> we, the, someone else coined the, the term. We, we stayed at the uh, Casa de Cuba. This is what we called it. Nice. Nice. We, we uh, also ate outside. So that, maybe that's a COVID thing. Why not? Well, obviously not. Because obviously not a COVID thing, but why not? Um, do you have any aspirations to do anything else in the future? Um, hopefully... I am doing something else, actually. Um, What's that? You know, since COVID, I had a friend of mine that caught COVID. And she was in isolation going crazy. So she called me up and she said, let's write a screenplay. So I said, okay, she's an excellent writer, uh, very creative, um, has written screenplays before. She, she writes songs and we're writing a screenplay. 
I mean, we've been working on it since January. All right. What's the screenplay? Can you say? Uh, you know, it's really hard to describe. So I'd rather not. All right. But we've been like working on character development for about five months. And we're just, next week, we're moving into the outline. Can you say what kind of characters there are? Uh, whatever you're comfortable with. And I should also mention, I find these kinds of endeavors, these creative endeavors, uh, uh, how should you say, interesting. Um, I just think, I don't know how to describe why I find them interesting. It's just art in general uh, piques my curiosity. And I mean, art by definition is something that that is a little outside the box. So I like things that are outside of the box. I think that's the best way of me to, of describing it. Um, Definitely like things that are outside the box. But it's basically, it's a comedy. It's a relationship movie with, you know, it's, I mean, we've built these characters up so well. They've come to life. I feel like the, writing the movies is going to be extremely easy. So basically, it's a relationship movie for some kind of competition. And it's a comedy is basically what it is. It's a competition? There's a competition in it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to put it on the stream. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Uh, wasn't in expecting fact, that. I, I want to talk to you about it, so. Uh, okay. A screenplay and golf. Uh, let's, wasn't expecting that. Um, I know that you were also active in philanthropy. I know that you made... Um, you hosted, I, I don't know if you created or you hosted or just both a uh, charity tournament in 2009. Uh, did you ever do something similar? Did you do other? I uh, believe you have uh, some other involvement in, in philanthropy as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, I got together with the Nevada SPCA and we started uh, the charity event for the animals for the Nevada SBCA. And I guess you're saying it started in 2009, which I believe you, I'm not sure when it started, but we. <laughs> All right, we're going to run with 2009. <laughs> basically did it for about 10 years. And then COVID came along and it kind of, and Nevada SBCA changed management and did all that. And I really couldn't host a charity event uh, for the animals, but you know, a lot of people contacting me, when's the next one going to be? And, you know, we raised a lot of money. And one year I also did a charity event for the National Kidney Foundation, where basically all the money went to kids that were waiting for transplants on dialysis and couldn't really do much. So bringing entertainment to them and letting them live life a little bit better than they were. So basically it's, you know, for the animals, if it's animals or kids, it's like, it's just, it's ingrained in my heart. So I'd like to do another charity event or start one. It's usually in October or November. Uh, so probably 2023, I'm going to pick up again and do, you know, do a poker tournament for the animals. But I also, I also, um, help out a lot of different rescuers um some in new york some in vegas some in california you know oh, awesome i don't like to see animals suffer so anything i can do to help change that well the animals uh as the jungle man in behalf of the animals <laughs> by their power vested in me uh whatever that may be i uh the animals salute you, uh, presuming they're allowing me to salute you um, on behalf of them. Someone's got to fight for the animals. And I didn't know that you were doing it for 10 years. It's very admirable. Um, need more people out there supporting uh, whatever way they can. Pretty cool. It's a fun tournament. I mean, if we have it again, you know, you're in town, you're come play. It's fun. It's a sure. lot of fun. We get a okay. lot of people, a lot of people. Oh. That, I said, we get a lot of people 
Okay. Can I pretend to be an animal? Of course. You can do whatever you'd like. I feel like that would raise awareness and it would be fun. <laughs> yeah, you could all, yeah. I mean, it would be, you could even auction off like a poker lesson. You can do it like dress like an animal. <laughs> whatever you want. Anything goes. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm in more of the kids' sides of things, uh, but supporting, I mean, I support uh, the environment and nature too. It's just not, I didn't pick it as my particular focus. Uh, is, can you, is there any, was there any, in, how do you say, is there, was there any uh, point where you just decided, you know what, I'm going to start, I'm going to start my own charity tournament and help the animals. Was there any thing that triggered that? Any inspiration? You know, I don't know. I went down to the Nevada SPCA and I was talking to the um, director and he was talking about how they would love to save more animals, um, but they just didn't have the space. And hmm. I said, well, let's do, let's, let's raise some money. So that's how it all started. All right. And, you took and I know one too. year we raised so much money that they were able to build a whole new wing where they were able to, to save thousands of more dogs than they normally do. Oh, sweet. So. Cool. It's good to see your work go to good, good causes. Yeah. And uh, on the channel, we will, uh, we're happy to raise awareness for the cause. Um, you know, uh, need more cute animals out there. Need them to, uh, we need more, we need nature to thrive. That's what we definitely need. I'm all in favor of this. Uh, I want to go back to poker a little bit more. Uh, firstly, I want to ask a uh, little bit of a tangent, at least from our current discussion. Does, uh, would you say that being a woman helps you in any way with poker? Interesting. Uh, sure. Um, more so early in my career than later because later in my career I just played with you know mostly people I know and you know I don't think being a woman helps in that spot po you know players were just too good it wasn't you know they didn't think of me as a woman right right they don't they don't let the gender roles get too mixed up in the actual play Right. But, you know, like, you know, like I told you, I had my fair share of abuse. So uh, when they're, you know, when players are off their game is when I'm the happiest because they're definitely not playing as well. So, you know, a lot of poker players don't like playing with women. Hmm. So, you know, it, it helps me. Or I don't know if they don't like playing with women, but it's, you know, it's still a man's sport or competition or whatever it is. <laughs> so it's just, uh, they're not used to it. They're not used to the women. They're used to all dude, uh, gatherings. But I think I, I don't know. I just kind of slid in there. I'm like, like the, like a piece of furniture now in the room, you know, they don't look at me any differently. Or I don't think they do. I could be wrong. But they certainly don't treat me any, you know, any differently. But um, Okay. I want to also, uh, I want to squeeze this question in. Does po Would you say that poker applies to any other areas of your life besides being a mom? I think poker applies to almost everything in life. I mean, being a poker player, you always have to be on your game. You always have to be thinking and objective about how you play. You, there's money management involved. There's, um, I, I, you know, I just, you have to be aware. I mean, and I think that all trans transforms into how you need to be as a human too. 
I, I do mean, agree. I do think so. It's hard to prove, but I do think so. Um, go ahead. I mean, I don't think you're going to get much empathy at the poker table. It's kind of that's kind of like life too. You yeah. don't get no one's really. I mean, you get a little bit. <laughs> Same at the poker table. You get a little bit. You know, you get sorry, but still taking your money, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I remember one time Daniel. He had a bankroll of thirty thousand dollars, and he wanted to. I think we were playing fifteen hundred and three thousand, and he wanted to sit down and play, and he was completely wasted. He was so drunk. And I said, you can't sit down at your, with, your, with your whole bankroll drunk and play this game. And he didn't listen to me. So it's like, you know, when he sits down, anything goes, right? Yeah. And that's kind of tough. He should have. It would have been funny if he said, yeah, I can sit down. I'm going to. He did. He, sat down. he did say that. <laughs> but he didn't say it, but he actually said, you know, I don't care what you say. All right, that's that's even ruder. Um, that, that's less funny and it's rude still. Um, I don't know so it's rude. funnier for that reason, huh? Just I don't know if it's rude. He was just determined to sit down at the table. All right, well he can do what he wants with his drunk money. Um, he went before, home. Oh, <laughs> uh, well there you go, guys. That's what happens when you sit down and you're and you're drunk. All right. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish? Anything uh, you'd like to promote or somewhere people can go to learn about you? No, not really. Uh, you know, just hopefully look for me at the World Series. Hopefully I'll be playing some events, not a lot. Um, you know, I want to play the 50 this year because not because it's the 50, because it's only like a six handed game. So I won't be next to people because of COVID. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be defending my title. You're welcome to fight for the title. I'm going to put up a fight. Just letting you know. I'm letting you know right now. I will be having a similar attitude as drunk Daniel. Um, without the rudeness and more of the uh, the stubborn fight, you could say. <laughs> and, Daniel was never rude, but he was stubborn. I have to say that. All right. Well, I'm going to be stubborn about losing my money. I don't blame you. I'm, I'm not you know, winning, I'm not gonna let I'm title. Gonna, I know. That's pretty cool. I was rooting for you, but I had you know a lot of friends there. I was happy to see you in it with yeah, your I was, green hair. I loved your green hair. Thank you. Uh I was aiming for blue, but I'll take it. And <laughs> uh yeah, fighting for the greater good, fighting for the animals, by the way. So you should have been rooting more for me. I don't know what your friends are fighting for. Uh anyway, yeah come on down and uh, prepare for battle with the boys and I mean, maybe like the other girl, whoever else is, is joining. I don't know who plays this thing. I don't know. I'm very excited about playing it. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Anything else you want to talk about? No, I think that's it. I think, you know, you know, life is great. All right, guys, we're ending it with life is great. It's been uh, great having you on the podcast, Jennifer. And uh, yeah, it's been fun seeing this Thank World Series. I yeah, I appreciate you having me, and yeah, good luck this World Series. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to this episode of Winning the Game of Life. Tune in next week for another great episode. Of course, hit subscribe and follow Dan on Instagram at the Dan Cates. 